Good morning. It's been a while. Sorry. <laughs> I've been swarmed. Um, I hope you're doing well on this prayer Wednesday morning. Um, I hope you're prayed up, get up. And yes, no, I'm not sad that the floor is not filled up sad with white as predicted. Oh no, I'm not sad. It's cold still, but yes, it's okay. It's not inches as was expected. So I'm sure we're not out of the woods, but I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Freezing, fingers burning. But it's okay. So let's get into that. This morning, I want to speak about something that's been a buzzword, compassionomics, where science meets art. Yeah. I want to talk about compassion fatigue this morning. So the new buzzwords in, in a lot of people's mind is compassionomics. And it's an hypothesis and, and an experimental approach where they talk about um, his compassion science, is compassion and arts, can the two be blended? And what really is compassion? And there's research been out on it. And um, where recent reports indicate that healthcare is experiencing a compassion crisis. And the in the research, it was shown that in America, the hospitals there, that a lot of people who had crisis traumas in their lives, when they were interviewed on us, what were their memory? Their memory wasn't, and I kept saying it, people will not remember what you, what you are supposed to do, the amazing stuff that you do, but the way you treat them, they'll never forget. And this research proved just that. People will never forget how you make them feel. And what this research proved that because of the lack of um, burnt out, which people make excuse for burnt out of mistreating people for burnt out and overwork. And I don't buy that subscribe foolishness because I hear it every day at work. When they're rude to you, you see them laughing with their friends and who they want to. And when they disrespect and racially discriminate against you and discriminate against you for whatever other reason, and you try to hold them accountable, they pull the burnt out card. Yeah, that's what they do. And then you, if you stand long enough, you see them laughing and carrying on with their colleagues inside while they ignore the patients knocking or they ignore you and disrespect you and treat you like trash in the bin because you don't look like them or they feel threatened by you. Mm -hmm. And then they pull the burnt out overwork card. Yeah, that's what people do. And when you hold them accountable and responsible, they pull the compassion fatigue card. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying people are not compassionate. If you are feeling overwhelmed and compassion to the point where you're gonna mistreat your patients or mistreat somebody else because burnt out and compassion fatigue is not only for the hospital setting. Many of us are spiritually burnt out and we experience compassion fatigue. So if you're in that state, it's time to step back and reflect. If you're at work and you're snapping at people and you're being rude and distasteful, it's time for you to take a holiday or take a break. Too many of us don't know how to step back and how to enjoy a quiet space. Now take it from me, <laughs> who had every single slot in my, you know, from my accountancy um, profession, I was like a ticking time bomb. Never had, I mean, when I'm on time off, I mean, I mean, people remember that I'm overbooking my free time. I was double booking. I mean, even when I was home, not working, I was people. I remember people were worried that I was going to lose the plot because I was so busy all the time. And they, I mean, at one point I was like, no, I just did what I had to do. I mean, I kept the things that kept me going, like my gym membership. And um, I, I, I used to teach us. I knew the things that would, I needed to keep me motivated. And I volunteered until I get back into work. And um, I was so overbooked, even not working at the time. <laughs> overbooked, a double booking. And the thing about it is I had to learn. I mean, CP has done some wonderful stuff in my life where, you know, I have to learn self-care and putting in boundaries in space because some people just use you. They don't love you. They like what you offer. And when you can't offer it, they just dump you to the side in a bin. Mm -hmm. And some people that in your circles that you hold as friend, and as I was reflecting this morning, you know, I don't put any people in my life that as me as option, as priority anymore. And sometimes as Christian, we put people in our lives as priority that as us as options. If you has me as option, you're not priority on my list. You're not God. So I can't do it out you. That the, the only person I can't do it out is God. And I will always love my families and my friends, but I don't have to make you, I don't have to make you make me the victim or me becomes the option. Likewise, the people you work with, a job. If the job has you as an option, why are you making them your priority? They are your number one. You're overworking yourself, but you're only a priority and a gap filler to them. As I've always said to people and staff, 
You think this, you are the ace in this job. You die tomorrow morning before your body call. They're calling the agency and trying to replace you. So if you're at the point in your job where you're mistreating people, you're always angry and snapping at your colleagues and, and you know, you're making lots of mistakes and you're not getting the job done. It's time to take a break. I remember the first time I had to lazy in my bed and do nothing. It felt so bad. I felt so out of place and uncomfortable. I got to the point where I now crave that time. Like last week, I was so swamped with my assignments and I had to pause and have the all mark moment because I was so brain fried. I had to step away. I mean, before that, I would feel, for last week maybe, I'd feel even guilty just having a hallmark moment. Normally, I'd go have a run moment. I was freezing outside and feel like I could do that because that will kind of refresh my body, my brain with oxygen. Or I, and there were times when I get up and I walk around the room for five minutes, maybe because it was cold inside. And I didn't want to keep eating on all the time. So keep putting the eating on because the price was just spiking up. So I was under my sheets doing my work, which I'm not supposed to do. And I was so... I was so tired, my feet were cramping up and I had to give myself permission to get up and walk around the house. Normally I would sit at the table and I would go for hours nonstop until I get those papers done. I would have got them done. I would be in a better place than I'm at right now, but I'd be exhausted and fried. So some of us are a typers and we driven, driven by challenges, driven by dreadline, but our world is suffering from compassion fatigue. And I go back to the example I start with. You see, um, many people in all, I'm going to read that research for you for a few minutes. It says, recent reports indicate that health care is experiencing a compassion crisis. And this is not only health care. An absence of inconsistency in compassionate patient care. It is currently unclear if on what extent this exerts significant effects on health and health care. I do know that this affects the patient's well-being because they know. When you hear patients keep saying, oh, I don't want to bother them. That's their job. You're not bothering them. And workers, when you make your patient feel like they're bothering you, something is wrong with you and your job work. It's unethical and not in the right stance. We emphasize that compassionate care is beneficial for patients, better outcomes, healthcare system and payers to lowest costs and healthcare providers, lower burnt out. Compassion, com compassionomics is the branch of knowledge and science study of the effects of compassionate healthcare and herein, we describe a framework or hypothesis testing. If the hypotheses are confirmed, compassionate healthcare are established in the domain of evidence-based medicine. Now, in where I'm at right now, their concept is that everybody can do spiritual care. What they're mixing up is compassionate care. It's everybody's job to do compassionate care. And this is how they don't play spirituality and spiritual care. Hey, how are you doing, Mr. So-and-so? Good evening, Mr. So-and-so. How are you today? That is not spiritual care. That is compassionate care. It just dawned on me yesterday that's, that's the mistake they're making. People are thinking, the nurses are thinking, oh, I don't want one more thing to do. It's your job to be compassionate to people. I know many of you enter the nursing profession these days for the money and for the security of the job. But if you're still in the job for the security and the money, and you're still on doctors too, and you're still not there, acquire the compassion, it's time to check yourself and stop wrecking patients' life. Your bed space that you're trying to get them out of. I never forget when I was in hospital um, in 2008, and I remember my doctor said to me, I was the quickest recovering patient he's had for a while, and how my system heals so quickly. Yes, I was healthy. Yes, I was at the peak of my fitness, which I was grieving also because my body was toned. My muscle was formed. I was getting near my six pack. I was feeling amazing. And I was grieving the fact that he had to cut my skin. I was upset, grieving. And but because I was eating healthy, I was in top shape. Um, I was easy to heal properly. But what was significant also was the ambience of the place I was in. One, I was I knew God was with me because when I went there the morning and I see burgundy curtains and burgundy duvets on my bed. Yeah, I wasn't in a public hospital. I That was one of the best hospitals, Wellington Hospital. I'll never forget that. And when it was food time and I see how my food was presented like a five-star, the ambience, everything about it. I, I had bought, bought robes in my bathroom, my flip-flop slippers, fluffy slippers like a hotel. I knew God had my back because I was looking for burgundy drips 
uh, and burgundy bedding for my house. Yeah, I like burgundy, but I mean burgundy today too. But it's because um I decided that I wasn't going to make myself sick and look sick. Because when you're sick and you look and feel sick in your environment, it does it's not conducive for healing. So I knew I was going to be home for a while. So I was setting the pace that when I look in the mirror, I've made add my hair comb. And I even the girl even had convinced me to put some streaks in it just to look bright. Because when I look in the mirror, I didn't want to look sick or feel sick because I know I wear sickness on my face. And I, I didn't want to feel or look haggard because that doesn't help or promote healing. So I changed, I was trying to change my curtain in my room. I didn't get it on time. My bed was burgundy. Everything was just bright and yeah, conducive for healing. So I went in the morning and I didn't get my burgundy curtain. And I remember I was disappointed I didn't get my burgundy curtain to match my sheet. And when I got to the room eight o'clock the morning, I remember looking in the room and I saw burgundy and cream curtains and burgundy duvet. I'm like, who goes to hospital? And a burgundy drapes and burgundy <laughs> duvet. I'm like, this is a hotel. You know, side so was amazing. The building was conducive for healing. I don't know why hospitals have to be so dead and dry because not even in the NHS or private the government, it doesn't matter. It was conducive for healing which is why they're saying, get, stay out when you're in the hospital. Don't stick in the hospital gown. Put on your a normal clothes. I remember what for that, a drive on that. Because it helps you feel better when you're in your normal clothes and long for home. It's about being compassionate and intentional about the care we give. And so I was thriving. I mean, the nurses were just chit chatting out my room all the time. And they keep checking them. Like, I'm good. Leave me alone. I don't want no medicine. I don't want nothing. I'm good. Just want to sleep. I was enjoying the best sleep of my life. That was the best sleep of my life. I never forget it to the point where the doctor thought I was going to sleep away and die because I didn't want to wake up. I didn't want to wake up. I was having the best sleep of my life. And he kept, it took me so long to bring back to my room because I refused to wake up because I was just, leave me alone. I want to sleep. And I was just enjoying my sleep. And he was just slapping me, wake up, wake up, wake up. And I'm like, just leave me alone. I want to sleep. Just leave me alone. <laughs> and even when I was in a room and they were like, the doctor said, so you're not taking the meds. I said, I don't want the meds. I want to sleep. Just leave me alone. I just want to sleep. And she was like, ah come on, you need to take your meds. I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. Just leave me to sleep. Not to check on you. I said, I don't want no check on. I just want to sleep. Just don't disturb me. Let me sleep. And they just kept checking on me all night. And I'm like, this is painful. This is. And that morning I woke up feeling rested and on cloud nine because I had a well sleep. And you know, this is what compassionate is about. Being compassionate. I remember she, I was singing in my room all the time and worshiping. And one day when she came in, I wasn't worshiping. And she was like, are you not singing this morning? And she was like, you in pain here? <laughs> well, you're not even taking the medicine. I didn't want nothing in my system. I should just take a little bit, man. You'll be fine. And um, she, I remember I couldn't sing because I was in pain. And she stuck her earphone in my ear from her phone so I could listen to music. She was a Christian. That was compassionate care. That's what I'm talking about, compassionate care. Not losing your compassion. She recognized. And even on the Sabbath, she said, you're going to have a lot of visitors today. And I'm like, mm-hmm. You're talking about Claudia here. My church don't love me like that. Mm -mm, I'm the old castle church. And I only had one person apart from my family came to visit me, which I didn't take it personal because I didn't expect them to be there because I'm not in their priority list there at church. They only use you, use you for your talents. And no, I'm never accepted there. So I wasn't expecting that. What was disappointing that they were expecting them and it could have been a witness. And I'm like, that's a missed opportunity for them to have witnessed to these nurses who thought because I was always worshiping and stuff that my church would have come and love on me and that didn't happen. So that was the church issue, not my issue, but it just was a sad encounter and a disappointment that they missed the opportunity to witness. When all the people are sick, they can't even, you get messages at church, don't go visit them because they, they, they need to sleep. And when you're sick, nobody come. Mm -hmm. That's been my experience most of the time. So, but the point I'm making is a compassionate care, the compassionate care. And we still have a God who is compassionate. And we are burnt out. We're burnt out in our works. We're burnt out in our spirituality. And that's where I'm getting. We are not being compassionate Christian because we lack compassion ourselves. We're not being compassionate Christians because we are experiencing possibly something called compassion fatigue. And the first thing is 19 verse 4 says, Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Oh, God, those words. <laughs> How many times have I said those words? Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. So most of us think of slot as laziness, a dislike of work or any physical exertion. 
having watched the, the local zoo slot in action or, or rather in action, I think the sluggish animal is appropriately named. Spiritual slot, however, is far different than being a couch potato. Originally, the sin of slot was two sins, sadness and acedia, or acedia, compiled by the Evagrius of Pontius at 4th century monk. These two capital sins were part of a list of eight he believed were the greatest threats to devote monasticism. We know that sadness, and it's important to remember that the sadness which Evagorius found problematic for his monks was not clinical depression. It was a despondency or gloom that easily came upon a monk living as an aesthetic life of prayer, fasting and labor in the middle of the Egyptian desert in the fourth century. It was unhappiness with one's present situation and the melancholy that comes from longing for something in something different. So if you're living an aesthetic life and it's making you feel like this, there's no benefit in that life as far as I'm concerned. So it was distress at one circumstance. And as we know, there's some churches who constantly have their members going on these pilgrimages. I'm not throwing shades, but I'm just speaking the truth. And they have to suffer, go for this long period of time, and they have to expose themselves to barefootedness and going on these issues and stuff just to feel close to God. God doesn't want you to distress yourself to feel close to him. Nothing is wrong with fasting and stuff like that. But if you're doing all this stuff and your mind is not on God, what's the point in doing it? It was distress at one's circumstances and the inability to give thanks in all things. That's the point I'm making. In this troubled world, we certainly don't have to be monks or to suffer the kind of sadness. Acedia comes from the Greek and means without care or concern. Rather than laziness, it's apathy or a fatigue of mind and soul. A spiritual boredom or awareness. And if you look in our churches, there's an acedia going on. A spiritual boredomness results in listless prayers and study or services. In the midday heat, the monks were tempted to, to let their minds wander during study and prayer and then fall asleep, causing Evagoras to call Assidia the noonday demon. Seeing the correlation between sadness and Assidia in the late 6th century, Pope Gregory combined the two sins and into slot. A few mornings ago, you know, I felt, felt like I was so compassion fatigue. I began to understand what it means, sorry, to have spiritual slot. The previous day's discussion in the Bible as None of it was rejuvenating my soul. As a matter of fact, I was just filling in and it was just not refreshing my soul because I was physically exhausted. When you look around us, there's so many things going on. There's hurricanes, there's threats from war, from Russia, from Korea, from all over the world. And when you look at this, people are sick with all sorts of ailments and diagnosis and cancers and metastasizing all over. And nursing homes, neglecting people and hospitals, waiting lists or highs, your friends and family, some people committing suicide and, the, and and there's no longer a need to care and pray as Christians in our world. Or we pray and we just pray from a distance and we're quick to pray, but we're not physically being there or ministering to the needs of these people. Elijah probably felt um, that fe um, while he was fleeing from Jezebel, as he sat under the broom tree, and as he waited to die and wanted to die and was suicidal in his thoughts, because that's what it was, asking God to kill him. Um, that's spiritual stuff. And it's not just monks and Old Testament prophets that had been afflicted by it. The enemy wants us to all become so downhearted and downtrodden and world weary that we are fall into spiritual inactivity or slot. Elijah was cured from his spiritual slot by food, rest and a talk with the Lord. Although he didn't eat Although I, you know, I was struggling to balance my time with exercise and eating, getting my work done, I was eating, but I was eating not the right type of food. I needed to be nourished by the scripture. Even though I didn't sleep, I needed to be rested in the word that that could get me through, like Elijah. I needed a prayerful chat with God, so to pause during my busy schedule and make sure I had those connections to get me going on my assignments and to get me on that role. God whispered to Elijah and gave him his new strength. He whispered to me and refreshed me with his words of love, comfort, reassurance, and hope. Psalm 94 verse 18 to 19 says, I cried out, I was slipping, but your unfailing love, O Lord, supported me. When doubts filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. And now, dear brothers and sisters, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable says Philippians 4 verse 8, what is right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So if you're experiencing physical compassion fatigue today, 
or spiritual compassion fatigue or sloth. I just want to encourage you to pause in your day and to feed yourself physically and spiritually. If you're not resting for whatever reason, take time to breathe, take time to rest because you cannot give what you do not have. If you are burnt out, it's, we were having a meeting yesterday and I had a session on compassion fatigue and then we had our VBRP session. And it's surprising that people are thinking that if I care for myself, then um, others might think. And I just say this, I don't really care what others think about me. If you don't know my quality and my ethics, if you see me taking a break out of a break time and the work I do, and you think I'm slacking off and you're worried about taking your break because what others going to use it and abuse it. I take my break. I mean, these people, these people don't know what busy is. Do they really know what having four, five, six back to back codes or traumas? And they're talking about, oh, well, what makes you think you have to go from, you don't have a choice. You were page there. I keep telling them they don't know what busy is, you know, I kind of miss that busyness. There are times when I couldn't even have time to breathe. But I miss it. Somehow I miss it. You know, I miss that. But adrenaline, it's not been wanted either. Because there were times when I just wanted to break. But, you know, you were at work and you you were busy. I mean, there were times when I didn't even know what time it was. I was just, I had to keep going. Sometimes just pausing enough between between appointments because they were emergencies just to take a break pausing to take a break and to unwind and to get that connection because that's all the time I had because I was responding to cold, responding to this, responding to different traumas. So they don't understand that concept. They, they love to judge you. Yeah. They love to do that, but that's okay. If it makes them feel better, it's not okay to do, but if it makes them feel better, um, that's up to them. They have to work on them. So what I'm saying is don't be hitting on other people and not living what you're preaching. Compassion fatigue is not just for the healthcare sector. Many of us are overwhelmed and we need to stop and take a break. We're not helping ourselves physically. We're not helping ourselves spiritually. We're not helping our family members because we're neglecting them and we're neglecting to care for our being and her body is a temple of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning for the reminder that we need to pause, Lord. That's why you give us the day of rest. But we're so exhausted in the week when Sabbath comes, Lord. We don't even enjoy true rest in you. We, we more look forward to the physical rest, Lord, than to the spiritual rest that comes with knowing who you are. So we apologize, Lord, for the intemperate lifestyle we've had. This is the plan of the enemy, Lord, to keep us so busy that we're not in the place where you can bless us, where we can hear you, Lord, where we can you can use us to our fullest of opportunities. So we surrender ourselves to you and ask you, Lord, what is it you want us to learn about you and about your rest today? Holy Spirit, we invite you in to minister to our soul. I ask you to do it again, Lord. Thank you, God, for keeping my mouth yesterday. I gave it to you before I left my home. And I ask you, Lord, to keep my mouth on the subjection and release it when you want to and put words in my mouth. There were things that were said, Lord, that... <laughs> <laughs> maybe merited some response but I respect the fact that I remain calm nonetheless so today again I ask you to keep God of my mouth and my own demeanor today in spite of what happened and what's said let me only speak by your permission and with your wisdom and authority forgive us Lord and build us as we go on the treacherous journeys in Jesus name amen have a blessed day bless bless God love you